So, hi Lucy. How Hello, are you? Andy. How are you feeling today? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this. Is that what, what is that? <laughs> Jumpy. <laughs> is that a real feeling? It feels very real to me. Yeah. Right now. And is it is it if you have to describe it, is it a psychological thing or could you relate it to a more technological? Oh, I think it feels I, I um express feelings maybe right now as like a physical sensation hmm. so very much in the body yeah which is of course how you usually work how i know you work because we go way back when you were still working at philips in eindhoven and i am from mu in eindhoven and we met when you were doing um your first experiments back then still together with bart hess which were also very physical, experimental, um, um, performative, mm -hmm. uh, learning by doing things. Yes. Can you describe a bit how you worked back then? I would say it, we treated it like a sport. It was very primal mm -hmm. um, without knowing what the outcome was going to look like. So it was very much like a, a blind exploration and an inquiry into a single material, balloons. Um, and from that, we gave, us, uh, gave ourselves a day to make a photograph. Yeah. And um, your background was in ballet dancing. And how did you end up within visual culture, design, body architecture? I would say it's um, an innate propensity to do something that I have never done before, which each time charges the course in a different way, um, while also, you know, being steered by things that are curious um, and that I don't understand, that are complex. And so, by making, I help to bring form to something that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. For example, genetic engineering, as, a, as an example. Yeah. And, and it always has to do with this bodily experience and um, the work you've done in between back then and now is very, sometimes it's very filmic it's always you experiencing something like living in the future or mm. how would you describe your, your practice? You have like, you, you use the term body architect, um, but it's also like exploring possible futures and how we would behave in those. Yes. I, I, I speculate on, far future or near future scenarios, the, the focus is not on saying this is what it's going to be. It's not about problem solving. It's very much asking the question, what if we could design the body from scratch, for example? What if we don't have physical contact in the future? So it's more like posing a question and asking then what, or do we want it? Yeah. Um, but creating films, installations, photography, edible technologies as a, as a way to familiarise, democratise, um, you know, scientific advances um, or just new concepts in technology so that they're available to, you know, everybody, not just the people who understand that kind of language or expertise. Mm -hmm. Like one of the questions you just posed was like a speculation in the future, but now it's real. Yes. <laughs> uh, very much. What if we uh, cannot have physical contact? Um, uh, how, how does this whole situation with COVID-19 affect your practice? Mm. 
I, I think question. like everybody, we were all shocked when it happened. It was happening at different times in the world. So, um, you know, those in, in China were the first to kind of experience this um, unprecedented uh, situation. I, I spent the first two months kind of like a rabbit in the headlights because my work for the last six years has been about creating prototypes that use air to inflate or deflate membranes around the body mm -hmm. as an antidote for a far future where we may be in a crisis of touch. There's no physical contact because of technology, uh, because we've exited Earth and colonised new planets, for example. And so when the pandemic happened, suddenly my speculative research became a reality and I was totally unprepared and had nothing to say. Mm. So that was kind of the first way it changed my identity, I would say. And, and also the work that we've, we've um, made, the Solitary Survival Raft, our entire studio transformed as to how the work was made. Like mm -hmm. everybody, um, the way that we do things now is, is completely different. And so what, what we're starting to learn as a studio is that what is possible <laughs> under these extreme situations. And if this is possible to do, what else greater than that is possible? Yeah. yeah. One of the things I was, I was wondering, because when we started talking about this commission for the Real Feelings exhibition, um, we were referencing uh, the compression cradle and the compression carpet, which were made in a completely different time. Yeah. Um, um, could you describe the, how these were conceived and with what ideas you made these in comparison to, to what the uh, solitary survival raft is made with? And then after that, we can go to your presentation about yeah. the raft. Yeah, so the, the compression cradle, um, which was exhibited at Broken Nature in Milan, commissioned by Het Noy and uh, mass in Sydney was um, a machine that hugged the body uh, for the, this future where there would be no human touch. Mm -hmm. um, it was looking at how we're forever connected um, with technology and um, perhaps that this form of intimacy, this public arena of in intimacy may one day become normal. Maybe one day we all have these machines in our home or we go to a retail store to be hugged by a machine. So mm -hmm. it was very much, um, yeah, an inquiry into how uh, humanity may evolve based on technology and our devices. Yeah. The, the way the work was made was, was very experimental. Um, we had no idea what the artwork would look like in the end. And I think that, um, you know, our process is very much about valuing risk. And mm -hmm. so whoever comes into the mix, whether it's a curator, a commissioner, a client, everybody has to kind of sign off on this is an experiment. We don't know what it's going to look like. And so that is kind of the, the start of how we unfold and begin prototyping. Yeah. Yeah, that, it feels like that. That it's a it's, that it's a machine that's that's being built, well conceived, and but in retrospect, I would say that the compression carpet looks more soothing and uh, intimate and has more like a positive uh, feeling to it than the raft is having now. Do you feel that too, or? Well, I would say that the reason. For that is that the the way that I work is I consider myself as an interpreter. I'm sort of picking up on these very weak signals, and you know, during this time which this artwork was made, the world was giving off a very fuzzy, uncertain, where are we going signal. 
-hmm. And I can't turn on or off this antenna or what it, whatever it is yeah, yeah. that I, what you pick I up. filter. I think it's my body as a kind of instrument. Um, and so th that is probably why. And even the photography is very much about um, bury, do we bury our head in the sand or do we face up to the stuff that no longer serves us? Mm -hmm. And so this work is very much about laboring in the unknown and um, w what can be achieved when we um, are confronted with fear and use it as a, as a um, potential as opposed to a door closing. Yeah. Clear. Could you introduce the solitary survival raft to us through your presentation? So I, I think this image is particularly um, poignant. <laughs> I'm stacking objects on air and um, this, this time of making the artwork has, has been about a discovery. Where are we going? How do we get there? How do we make something? Um, do we try and forget our reality or do we, you know, use this as an opportunity to, to transform and adopt a different way of working? And I, I think that um, I... <laughs> I, I see art as a kind of endurance sport. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that we are all in this game. We are all enduring right now. Mm -hmm. um, and and this, uh, this photograph and the one following were two shoots that we did in the studio two days before, you know, we were sent home. I'm in Los Angeles we were sent home and, and actually it was one of the last times that we were uh, working into the studio up until this point. And so the way that we work is very hands-on. I use the camera to document. And this was, we had, um, you know, received a brief from you. We had responded with a proposal. And this was my kind of like, this was my starting point. Um, How did it become a raft? How did, you, how, how did you get from like the cradle and the carpet to a raft? I, I think for me, a, a raft is about um, when something is wrong, we, we need to get out quickly um, or it's, it's easily uh, put together to change course. Yeah. And so I think that that's exactly what had happened was it's an we were working yeah, we were working in the studio and then we were told to like change and go to another island essentially. Mm. And so previously, this is how we worked. We would be in a workshop, there would be, you know, five people around, we'd be experimenting with materials, we'd, we'd review, go back, build another prototype. And, and in the case of the, the raft, <laughs> everything um, that was the starting point was was made in my living room. And then uh, through documentation, these different steps or the, the next kind of um, way that the, the, the raft was developed was very much guided by what, what I was making in, at home. Mm. Um, and, and then <laughs> we would, our, our entire pipeline was thrown upside down and I'm actually really grateful for um, the, the challenge of changing the way or adapting the way that we work because um, I, I think we never would have worked like this before. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now, um, you know, we're a nimble team. Um, Alice and I would be having a conversation, my producer, about the prototypes. We would talk to uh, Tina, a designer, take those ideas, put them into a render, send them to you, speak to our soft goods, Anya Jalak, and then have everything fabricated and very much 
uh, very willing Uber drivers who were transporting all of this stuff, like shuffling it between our houses was, was the way that it was developed. Mm -hmm. um, and I would argue actually that this is precisely how Bart and I were working with Lucy and Bart back in the day, let's mm -hmm. call it. So yeah. it's almost like going full circle where my neighbors are also like looking through the window going, what is she doing? You know, mm -hmm. videoing herself in these, in these weird ways. Yeah. I think the thing that hasn't really changed is um, every work is, is photographed um, before it leaves and the, before um, the photo shoot, I, I make a shot list. And so this is like me making a shot list of like, how am I going to <laughs> appear in the work or how will we photograph the work? Um, and then again, sort of like, what are the next steps of the shape. And so the, the way that the shape changed was something that happened very last minute, the, the inflation, um, it was over a phone call, the course change, we'd already built. So this is the prototype that did not um, make it to Basel. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, this was the starting point. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, ultimately what, what starts as a sketch, which is, is, the initial conversations that we have with with you um, and Sabina and Ariane then slowly gets resolved through the making. Yeah. Um, and the the idea of it being or because we we um, were conceiving an exhibition on on emotion and technology and this bodily. Um, of course, emotion is very bodily connected, but it's not the same thing. How would you um, connect emotion to this raft? And, and I mean, it is technological, but it's also very um, uh, touch-based. I had the privilege of touching it in Basel, um, and it feels it feels in a special way. It has a very soft and but but also um, like rescue life rescue feeling to it. It's vulnerable, but also very strong. It has all these like opposite uh, connections to it. Mm. Is that what it usually is? We like it's it's blown up and deflated. So it's, it's all these um, uh, connections I, that are, yeah. I, I think that what you just described are the psychological and emotional feelings of making work. Yeah. You know, you have moments of like expansion and, and you know what you're doing and then you contract because you, you, you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so strange and out of my control that that happens, that that translates, but yeah. somehow it does. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that also uh, the, this, the way, I, I have never worked in this way before. Um, and so th this model here was unwrapped, made into uh, textile patterns that were then Ubered to Anya's house. And then the, the whole second prototype began to come to life. And, mm -hmm. you know, Anya's having her own expansion and contraction and let's say internal meltdown crisis. So she's having her own mini endurance sport as is Alice, mm -hmm. you know, we're working remotely. So I think that the, the, um, the emotion it takes to make something that has never been made before and the energy around that and, and, the, and the people that we are very lucky to work with is how you get something that is alien, um, can be both vulnerable and strong at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, and it's always so strange when th this is receiving it for the first time. This is Alice you know, receiving the artwork for the first time when it's all together. No longer is it a sketch or a, you know, something that's made with textile and pins, but it's a real life personality, mm -hmm. let's say. 
Yeah, it becomes like that in, in an exhibition, especially because a lot of the work in the exhibition is screen-based and this is like one of the very prominent um, installations that you can really move around and you would really love to be in. Uh, also, but also I think it's also triggering the imagination of yourself lying in there. Now, I think this was one of the first times you were not at the opening of um, showing a new work. You were long distance uh, there, but not physically. How mm. was that for you? <laughs> really, I mean, really strange, but also really normal because this screen is my tether yeah. to the rest of the world right now. Mm. Um, so we are so good at adapting. Humans adapt, which is precisely why it's so important for us to question the potential um, manifestations of technology because otherwise very quickly we'll be down a path in three months time and suddenly look back and be like, how did we get here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we submit to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. True. Was it weird to see other people in the raft? Because, I mean, with the photographs and with Alice, Alice is sort of close to you, but to see other people in it? Um, or is it nice to see other people in it? That can also be um, intriguing, I think. It's so... I, I don't know. I um, I get nervous um, is the first thought. Like, you know, what if, what if, what if, what if? Yeah. Um, you know, what if it goes wrong? What if they don't like it? Um, but, you know, it's out in the world. Mm. And uh, the strange thing is, is that it left LA, you know, two, two months ago. Mm. And so, so much time has passed until, you know, you receive it. Um, it's shown publicly. So um, I would say the process has now entered a new phase of experimentation mm -hmm. because I think that the other opportunity first of all, the opportunity to make a new work for a show is, you know, the first, um, the first thing, which is wonderful. But the second thing is then to be able to test it on audiences and get feedback mm. or, or for you to even just say it feels vulnerable and strong at the same time. I, I didn't think about that. Mm. And so I really love learning how other people see the work because it gives me a different angle, insight or edge to how I perceive it. Yeah, true. I can imagine that it's different to hear other people talk about it or their experience. So different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So one of the, the um, associations I didn't have from the start, but when I saw it coming together and saw the, the first pictures you sent, I really had the association of it with this other very um, well-known raft of the Medusa by Jericho, yeah. uh, which is a painting, of course, and it's totally different, but it's also a raft. And it was like this, it was this end of an era raft also with um, the end of, of Western colonization and the ship wrapping of slavery and, and all of these things that were happening back then. Um, and in a, in a, in a weird way, this also feels connected to this like major shift in, in history. Do you feel that too? Do you see that connection or do you have other connections to, um, existing works or literature or, or things mm -hmm. that, that come fall into place when you see the final work? I, um, there's a book called Endurance, um, which is about um, Shackleton's voyage across the Antarctic. Mm. And I've thought about that a lot during this time. Mm. And I think that right now, and we continue to do so, we are 
dismantling, disrupting, um, undoing so much of what has been done up. Um, and, and I think it's historical. And I think disruption is, is so potent and so uh, purposeful, but also so hard. <laughs> Yeah. But I think that um, this, you know, we, we did not wish this upon us, but I think that um, the way that we come out of it, both personally as, as studios, as cities, as, um, you know, as citizens of this world, I, I think that um, it is instrumental in steering the future. And um, I, I was reading last week that um, Generation X are 32% of the global population. And these are people between the ages of eight and 23. And also um, uh, the physicist Max Planck, I think the word, his surname is, says that that science can only evolve one funeral at a time because it takes one generation to pass before that can be uprooted and a new concept and theory can come in. Mm -hmm. And so for me, Gen Z, you know, this generation, what they're learning now and how they are adapting and submitting to a pandemic, it's so important to... to um, our future and how we respond. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Thank you very much for Thank you. All this information. This is the front page of, or not the front page, this is um, the newspaper today. Yeah. I saw it. Yeah. yeah. Looks great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for, for the conversation. And uh, of course, there's a lot more to talk about and to, to, to experience within the raft. I think, uh, I hope a lot of people will be able to see it either at HEC or next year at MU, because from March till June next year, it will be in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And hopefully we can tour it. So um, it would be nice Get to sail. For a lot of people, and especially maybe Gen Z, uh, to experience it. Would love that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Thank Anthony. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.